Hi, everyone. Welcome into our webinar, Energy Cybersecurity Threats and Opportunities in the Quantum Era. My name is Skip Sanzeri. I'm co-founder, COO, and board chair of QSecure. Our charge is to bring post-quantum cybersecurity to entities for U.S. national security, uh, commercial, government, and including infrastructure, power, and energy companies. Uh, quantum computers are very, very powerful machines, and these will crack our current encryption. On today's webinar, we're going to discuss what that means to our energy in infrastructure and our power grids. Bad actors are building quantum computers very rapidly, uh, and we're seeing nation states investing tens of billions of dollars into quantum computers that will specifically crack encryption. So this is something we need to pay attention to as we move forward here. We have a wonderful panel, an expert uh, group of panelists today for you, and we'll be discussing a lot of the issues that are coming our way and some solutions that might help as well. Our goal today is to make you aware of this quantum computing threat and hopefully have you take some action relatively quickly. Um, it's easy to start testing post-quantum cybersecurity and looking at, uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, how it might protect. Um, you don't have to make big commitments now, but we suggest that you start right away and start looking into this from a strategic standpoint at least, and maybe even again, testing or pilots, et cetera. Our timing is tight today. We're gonna to try to keep the webinar to one hour. So we won't have a lot of time for Q&A, but if you look in uh, the Zoom uh, section below, you'll see a Q&A section. We'd like you to go ahead and put questions in there. At the end of the webinar, if we have time, we'll get to as many as we can, but if you'd also put your email address, we'd be happy to co connect with you later and answer those questions offline. So without further ado, uh, let's move right into our presentation. Uh, I'm gonna hand this over to our panel now, and we've got, again, a great group of speakers here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dave Crothmer. I'm the CEO of QSecure. Um, I started out in my career in IT. I was a CIO in telecom. Um, went on to create a company that became Oracle's largest cloud partner, sold that, grew up in a jet propulsion labs, Caltech family, was always intrigued by physics. Um, so got the opportunity to connect up with Skip and Rebecca and Coast and, and formed QSecure. So um, I'll hand it over to Pete. Morning, everybody. Pete Ford. I'm the Senior Vice President for Federal Operations at QSecure. Come from a, a DOD and Department of Energy background and then a Defense Industry Executive. Found this great com uh, company and uh, the, the things that we were doing to make uh, quantum security backwards compatible with uh, legacy systems and a path forward into the future. It's a pleasure to meet everybody. Greg, I'll hand it over to you. Hello, I'm Greg Bullard. I uh had a career at Qualcomm, 24 years, doing a lot of cybersecurity, uh, building vulnerability analysis teams, heading up uh, the uh, hardware hardware uh, protection team, the hardware security team for uh, for the SOCs, all the all the chips that they make. Um, decided to join Q Secure uh, a few uh, several months ago, and having a great time as we try to bring the the technology that's needed to help defend against this this uprising, this uh, this attack that's going to come upon us very very quickly. Joanna? Joanna, you want to introduce yourself? Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Well, I don't have my picture yet. Uh, hi, I'm Joanna Peters, and uh, I, uh, I'm an advisor and board member, and I take deep tech, uh, like AI, ML, and quantum, and I turn the tech into businesses. And I'm the lucky person whose labor of love was to set up this en energy webinar today. And I'd like to thank Brandon and, uh, and Pat for all their efforts. And it's an honor to serve as an advisor and advisory board member of QSecure and others. And let me hand this over to Paul Barry. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Barry. Um, I'm a longtime uh, electric utility uh, executive and work for Duke Energy and uh, PEPCO in Washington, D.C., as well as uh, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power and Hydro One up in, up in Canada. Charles? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar. Charles Dickerson. Uh, I'm a longtime utility executive as well. I've worked in utilities from as far as north as National Grid up in the northeast 
down as far south Texas is Austin Energy and then Mid Atlantic as well. I'm now on the other side of the fence. I'm a regulator. I'm the president and CEO of an organization that regulates utilities um, through all of New England and regulates around about 70% of the electricity load in Canada. Back to you. You guys want to you guys want to skip slide? Great. Um, hey guys, I'm gonna talk a little bit about quantum computing. I'll I'll give you your three minute PhD in quantum computing, um, literally. Uh, so conventional computers have small word sizes, like 64 bits, and they largely process the world linearly. And we've been very very successful with a linear technology view of the world. We've solved amazing problems, created amazing technologies. Um, and we have pushed the capabilities on silicon um, to, to a great extent, but it's still a really small instruction size. Uh, six, 64 bits is eight bytes, so it's basically a, a word uh, in each instruction, and we process these things linearly. The challenge we run into is if, when we have complex systems, like a neural net, like your brain is a neural net, uh, you guys have around a trillion neurons in your brain. I'm sure I have less by now. But when you try and process these things linearly with small chunks, it becomes impossible because if I have to monitor a trillion neurons um, linearly, I just I'll never be able to get to a, a, a place where I can see the whole state of the system at once. So enter quantum computers. Um, a bit um, is called a qubit. And it's a fundamentally an atom or subatomic particle that we link together. And because of the nature of quantum mechanics, there's two principles in quantum mechanics. One is called superposition, where that atom can be here, there, or anywhere, makes a great bit. And then the second principle is called entanglement, where I can connect these things together. Well, we connect these bits, qubits together to create a circuit. So the beauty of a quantum circuit is that, say, you know, like Google's bristlecone is 73 qubits, um, the word size is equivalent to two to the 73rd. So that's equivalent to a Yoda bit of data, which is equivalent to all the data stored in the world in the last year in one instruction. So when I'm trying to solve complex problems that have many, many variables, um, like molecular simulation, where, uh, you know, a, a simulated, um, an atom can have up to like uh, 2.6 million um, states. Uh, so modeling it with a quantum circuit can be a very powerful thing. So there's huge opportunities for pharma, for simulation, for things that just have really complex variable sets. Um, one of the challenges is, and we're going to go into this in some detail, is the fundamental um, layer of our security is based on prime number factorization. Um, and classical computers really don't do that well. Um, I think it, they said uh, if you're trying to crack RSA, it'd take you millions or billions of years to do it linearly, but quantum computers will have the ability um, to crack those codes very, very quickly. Um, I'm going to pass it off now to the next speaker. Great, Pete. Thanks, Dave. So uh, I, if you guys hear me uh, break into an acronym, feel free to uh, write on the comments. I'm, I'm guaranteed to uh, pay penalties for acronyms. As a former fighter pilot, I tend to speak in those sometimes. So I'll, I'll try to go slower and make sure I, I, I lay out the current state of cybersecurity for us. Uh, next slide, please. So I just was done reading uh, one of the current bills in this 117th Congress, Bill 1260, that passed the Senate. It's already in the House and working its way through the authorizers and appropriators. Uh, and it's, it's basically the uh, U.S. Innovation and Competition Act. Uh, and the, it has throughout it the words quantum, uh, innovation, and China. So we're obviously talking peer, peer state uh, competition. So that nation state that we're talking about that's spending $100 billion to build quantum computer is designed to make sure that that quantum computer that does non-polynomial hard math is focused on, on the negative side, aside from all the other great things that come with a quantum computer, on the negative side, that is designed to look at the current state of encryption that does do non-polynomial hard math, break those down to factors really rapidly, 
and look at all the data that is harvested already, stolen or stored, waiting to be decrypted later. When it comes to the energy part of our critical infrastructure, a lot of what we do as far as nation state interaction, it's logistics, it's support, it's infrastructure and it's supply chain. So all of those things that are stolen or stored or harvested right now are looking to go, hey, where are the weak spots in this critical infrastructure that would absolutely keep them from doing what they already do? Your energy grid, your uh, ability to have uh, nuclear secrets or how you do the nuclear piece of energy or the nuclear piece of the Department of Defense DOE world, we want to uncover that. So it's very important for us to understand that started with the 14th five-year plan. It was mentioned in China's 13th five-year plan. It's obviously a five-year plan and they are very rigid about accomplishing everything they say they wanna do in that five-year plan. It's a matter of faith. So when you look at that, that nation has set up 1800 plus people focus specifically on developing quantum computing, quantum communication and quantum sensing all with the idea of this is the fourth information revolution. And we are about to get to that before you because we want to uncover everything that you have otherwise held uh, critical. Next slide, please. So in the cybersecurity side of our house, obviously uh, this, this slide has a few things on it. The, the piece of, that I wanna to talk to everybody is the networks, that we have right now, the infrastructure, the InfoSec architecture that we have in place. And that's what this bill is talking about too. Let's get to this. It's going to let us get rid of unsupported encryption or legacy systems, or at least shore up some of those legacy systems because they just are continuing open pipes for expanding attack services. The next piece is we have not prioritized nor have we funded our information technology, that our power grid, that our energy, that our supply chain, our supports, our logistics world lives on, we haven't prioritized those with money. So when you look at the one right below that, the memorandum from January 19th, it follows the May 2021 executive order that says, hey, Congress, hey, the rest of the government, here's what I intend. No more unsupported encryption. Please give me a modernization plan Please include post-quantum comm. Please give me quantum resilience. And let's tie up some of those loose ends that are quite frankly wide open pipes. As you look at that 19 January memo, that came out obviously in a top secret type fashion. We got the unclassified version released to, across uh, the internet. Uh, it's, it's on the White House website. And it basically says, please follow the money. Office of Management and Budget, I need you to do this. And by the way, this, this Congress, the 117th Congress, several bills, I've just mentioned 1260, already in authorization and appropriation side with professional staff working through them quickly is designed to do exactly that. I want to make sure I have a very solid defense to counter those new attacks. Stop this ability to store and harvest. Please give me pre and post quantum resilience so that I can have the internet that I want to have, the information security architecture that I know is going to be solid before and after quantum day. And that is what's going to give us resilience in the United States government, both before and after and during an attack. It will also help identify any data breaches, any of those harvested or stolen or stored type data. We can shore that up with quantum resilient either protocols or comms or modernization capability to get rid of unsupported encryption. And at the end, it really is, once we said, follow the money, we're, we're significantly interested in making sure that we keep our same capability in the United States government, both commercially and federally, before and after and during quantum day. The last piece I would add is the, the biggest one we look at in QSecure is are we able to give you quantum resilience and can we keep the same bandwidth and latency communication plans that you have right now with your existing system? And that's why the backwards compatibility of what we're offering is so significant because this is on us right now. Next slide, please. And with that, uh, without any other further questions from me, I'll turn this over to uh, Joanna, Charles and Perry and the panel.
Hi, Charles. Uh, let me introduce, uh, we've already introduced you, but I think a, a very germane question for you in your role is uh, regarding these risks that uh, Pete just described. What keeps you up at night? So again, hello and good morning. Uh, and thank you, Paul, and thank you, Pete. As, as you think about what Pete laid out, which is very significant and important that there's a nation state spending so much money trying to weaponize uh, a technology that's used for protection. Um, as a former utility executive and now someone who's responsible for regulating utilities to ensure the health of the nation's electric system, what keeps me up at night uh, is widespread outages. Now, one could say, well, have not widespread outages always been the case? And the answer is yes, but traditionally widespread outages have been a result of uh, a significant weather event a major storm, a tornado, or a hurricane. And despite the fact that those things have been very bad and devastating, they have tended to be localized. So if there was a hurricane in one part of the country, generally other parts of the country didn't uh, experience the same thing. If there was an ice storm in the northeast part of the country, historically didn't have an ice storm in the south part of the country. When we think about the ability of someone to disrupt the nation's electric infrastructure, which is critical infrastructure, um, that can happen through a cyber attack and permeate the entire nation or very, very large swaths of the nation in very short periods of time. Um, what makes this even more of a challenge in terms of what I have to do and what the industry has to do to keep the energy flowing is that as recent as 10 years ago, and maybe even more recently, the vast majority of the nation's electric infrastructure was not as dependent on the internet uh, the web and this connected network where all these things are in touch with one another, where you have so many points of possible penetration. Let me give you an example. Uh, as recent as 2007, there were probably in the neighborhood of about 7 to 12 million smart meters deployed across the country. Um, the most recent figures from uh, the Energy Information Administration showed us as recent as 2019, is about 115 million smart meters deployed across the country. So that's 115 million devices that are connected to an internet communications network that if someone were to be able to um, bypass encryption, break encryption, uh, and insert some type of malware, ransomware, it would disrupt not only the particular meter, but it can permeate throughout that entire um, utility customers, utility set, and because the utilities are interconnected, it can permeate throughout the entire nation. I just listed the meters. Uh, in addition to the number of meters that are now on the system, 115 some odd million, there are a number of homes that have smart um, internet connected thermostats. The utility um, industry itself has moved a number of its technology pieces that used to be contained in an island within the utility itself that are now also web connected. Now, these things are web connected for a very good reason. It allows the utility to operate more quickly, more resiliently, and, um, and with more discrete operating um, constructs. However, because these things are now connected to the internet, it lends itself or it lends the industry to a potential attacks cyber. So these are the types of things that make me wonder, it makes me toss and turn. Uh, it used to be when my phone rang at night, I was always concerned about whether or not someone was hurt from a safety perspective, which I still am. But being on the side of the fence now as a regulator, when I hear that, I'm very, very concerned about whether or not we have a cyber attack, one that could disable um, the nation's infrastructure. And the disabling it's as simple as being able to uh, compromise an element to open a switch, because in the electric industry, if a switch is open, electricity doesn't flow, or to shut down a generating source. The last point I would make in this regard, um, because a lot of people are hearing things about renewable energy. One of the things that we need to know is that all renewable energy sources, wind and solar, are what we deem as inverter-based resources which means that they have to take energy from the wind and from the sun and convert it into a type of energy that we can use in our homes and businesses. That inverter, that device is another point of entry that could particularly 
um, be compromised. And so when we think of protecting uh, our systems, our infrastructure, our critical infrastructure, those are the types of things that make me worry about what do we need to do to bring a solution to bear so that we can prevent or significantly minimize the likelihood of having this happen. Now that I answered your question, Paul, because as you said in the introduction, we did do our introduction, I had the pleasure of working closely with you when you was a CFO um, for PHI in Mid-Atlantic. I know you worked in other utilities around the country and have been a senior executive at Duke in the space of quite some time. Um, I can't imagine that the solutions that we're gonna bring to bear uh, for this are gonna be cheap. They're necessary, but they won't be cheap. So if you could give us some sense of how do you suggest we pay for these solutions, that would be helpful. Uh, thank you, Charles, and that's a great question. Um, as you know, ultimately, uh, investments like these and investments in cyber protection by regulated electric utilities will be paid by one of two stakeholders, uh, customers or investors. Uh, if, if it's paid by customers or ratepayers, utilities will need to recover these investments through cost of service rate making. Uh, state public utility commissions will need to deem these costs as prudent and the result, um, and result in customer rates that are fair, just, and reasonable. You could certainly argue that investments in cyber protection are prudent and equivalent to tree trimming to improve reliability and prevent prolonged outages during winter storms and other severe weather events. Uh, like these storms, we know that cyber attacks on US energy infrastructure and the Colonial Pipeline ransomware incident just last year, I think is a instructive case in point, are not hypothetical and have uh, actually already occurred. Uh, but unlike storms, uh, there's probably little opportunity for mutual assistance by other utilities to alleviate outages who may very well be facing their own protracted service disruptions. With regulatory recovery, uh, if it's provided by the regulators, utilities who generally have strong investment grade credit ratings uh, have ready and efficient access to both debt and capital equity markets. On the other hand, if these costs are paid by investors, uh, then utilities confront moral hazard issues, similar, I think, to the Eureka Storm situation where Texas generation operators uh, face potential weatherization investments and many did, did not make those investments. So absent regulatory relief or other market recovery mechanisms, uh, these costs would likely dilute investor earnings. Now, board of directors and chief risk officers will need to carefully evaluate these cyber risks and weigh costs and benefits. Uh, and in my opinion, investment in cyber protection, uh, it's really quite analogous to insurance protection considerations when you face potential black swan uh, issues with asymmetric risks. So with that, uh, Joanna, I'd like to turn it to you and, and, and maybe you can provide some perspective on what other sectors are doing. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Charles, and thank you, Paul. Um, look, I mean, with the other sectors dealing with cyber, um, we're not talking about your grandmother's cyber, you know, your phishing, your malware, your stolen passwords. I mean, they're still effective and successful. But what we're talking about here is cyber 4.0, you know, the coming quantum threat to cyber security. And are there any lessons to be shared and learned among the sectors? And what we're seeing is that there's an essential codependency among industries. They don't operate isolated from each other. So let's take banking and finance. You know, they're pretty proactive and ahead of the curve. And that's because they already understand quantum computing. It's hugely faster. It allows you to look at multiple different possibilities simultaneously. It's unprecedented in its ability to decrypt existing encryption systems. And it will take your identity, your documents, your assets, and more. And because they already know quantum can enhance performance, they use financial optimization with quantum algorithms to improve trading, to prepare and balance, rebalance portfolios consisting of traditional or alternative assets, stocks, bonds, derivatives, crypto. Ah, crypto, yes, the blockchain is a huge attack vector. You can glean insights, trends from the market, better understand your risk, 
and serve your pension and other customers. And because they're driven, the banking industry, by compliance and profit, banking is emerging from 14 years of strict regulation and oversight since the 2008 meltdown, which pretty much everybody was turned into a bank, whether you're an insurer, an investment house, or a money center bank under the Federal Reserve supervision. And that experience uh, led to a shared connectivity making hard decisions, strategic decisions in order to survive. And they're in sync with their boards and their customers' expectations for uninterrupted performance, for ESG, for cyber preparedness. And banks accept and view compliance and risk management as an integral part of their business model. And they shout it from wherever they can. Nothing more important than cyber you hear from Jamie Diamond, head of JP Morgan. And he knows that a one day shutdown of JP Morgan is $3.5 billion in losses to the community, to the US economy. Banks also understand that if you immunize yourself against quantum cyber attacks, including your legacy systems in multiple languages, that even if third parties are unprotected, once immunized, no contagion. And because they know that a single quantum attack can impair nearly 60% of all assets in the banking system and lead to over $2 trillion in damages here. And that's the Hudson Institute study. So the big asset managers, the financial institutions are confronting this quantum challenge as they have with other catastrophes. And Franklin Templeton, for one, is actionalizing it and is do something about it. So don't be surprised if you see preferred pricing for customers, counterparties, and vendors who do the same. Now, these industries are interrelated. And in fact, banks and energy companies are not dissimilar. They're both built on trust and expected to function. Y2K, for example, that was led by the electricity industry. They were the most prepared and the most ahead. Today, banking Jamie Diamond, again, nothing more important than cyber, Richard Click, FERC chairman. There is no doubt the biggest threat facing us is cybersecurity today. Both hold assets, customer do uh, deposits. They engage in complex borrowing and lending in the public and private markets. And they have extremely robust treasury departments with very sophisticated treasury professionals who can deploy capital very efficiently every day. They borrow and lend in the public markets with banks acting as a credit intermediary, funding, trading and settlement partner, and energy deploying capital with scientific understanding. Their customers have high expectations of performance and they both can optimize using quantum algorithms to improve, speed up, and answer intractable problems. And we just heard Paul talking about how to pay for cyber, its complexity, whether regulated utility or not. With banking, huge R&D and IT costs for spends, they're treated as capital costs under US GAAP financial accounting, and they're not charged to retail or credit card customers. As for other sectors, you know, again, the industries are all learning from each other. You can in manufacturing quantum proof your uh, facilities, your systems, your robotics, your automation today. But you manufacturing, you rely on two things, reliable delivery of electric power and reliable delivery of quality power, no voltage problems. So with manufacturing, until you build your own have access to a nearby microgrid or install solar or wind or other renewables. And even if you've quantum proofed your assets, you remain codependent on the grid if it goes down. And it's the same with transportation. It's just not the electrification of electric vehicles, but vehicles been serving as mobile storage for home outages. Everyone wants to be at the center of this new economy it's where the growth is. Even Elon and Tesla, part of this transformation, 
They've filed and they're now retail energy providers in Texas. And Musk's obsession with cybersecurity is well known. Back in 2017, he mulled about cyber-wide fleet hack of his Teslas. Same thing, transportation will be at a standstill if the grid goes down. So these industries are all related. The sectors may do one thing, but they interrelate with the other. And a quantum attack is not like a 10,000 year event. It's not an asteroid. It's like Y2K, which we prepared for, except that it could happen at any time and be way more costly. So why go through this loss and destruction when you can do something about it? And here's how you can do it. Over to QSecure CTO and Head of Engineering, Greg Bullard. Thank you, Joanna. And uh, especially thank you, Paul and Charles. Wonderful, uh, wonderful perspectives and insights. Um, so I'm, I'm here to talk to you about the uh, the the mode, the, the the approach, and the things you need to get in place to, to solve this problem. And also, I want to make sure to cover costs because I think the uh, I think some of the expectations that are uh, likely in the market are that costs will be extremely high to heal against the quantum attack. Uh, I think that uh, as we've seen some of the attacks, for instance, in the healthcare system, you know, my own uh, hospital network was was ransomed for for about three weeks this past year. Uh, you know, I'm sure their costs were ridiculously high because they had to do so much remediation. Um, the, the, the cost of actually protecting from the quantum attack, which could be dramatically more disruptive than a, than a uh, ransomware attack, I think those costs are not nearly in the uh, territory of the, of the remediation costs. So it's some, definitely something to, to start the discussion about right now. Uh, Pat, could I have the next slide, please? So to, in order to get to uh, get the easy path, these are the, these are the parameters that, that we believe you need to get right. You need the solution that you're going to deploy to be trusted. Uh, that means that the algorithms that are used and the systems are validated, standardized, certified, et cetera. Uh, the next thing that you really need is something that is easy adoption. The, the solutions need to be very simple. They need to be easy to operate. They need, need to be easy to support. Uh, they need to be trivially easy to deploy. And um, there is opportunity to accomplish that. Maybe it's not quite in the, uh, in the old school model of how you know, gear is bought and sold and, and deployed and everything else, but, but it, we, we believe that this is a, a pretty straightforward approach. Um, you need to have low risk for early deployment. So this means that in any system, you're making the minimal changes possible. You're delivering the minimum disruption to operations and to procedures and processes. And, and you're really pick, taking a close look at feasibility. You know, do, does the uh, solution feasibly uh, integrate into your system and in a way that, that can be executed by your teams? Uh, the next step really is you cannot upgrade a network in a night. So you have to have uh, the staged upgrade, and that means you have to be able to support managed fallback. So uh, I, I state this as managed fallback, not just fallback. Fallback would allow any system to decide at any point when it wants to downgrade to pre-quantum pre -quantum algorithms. Managed fallback allows you to control that. So at a certain point, you can declare, uh, you know, there's a deadline that everything has to be upgraded and every system past that time, either that has not been upgraded, either by policy cannot communicate any longer, or you at least have a nice auditable list of who needs to get taken care of and, you know, there, it can become a fire drill versus a uh, versus a managed and carefully orchestrated rollout. Um, you need end-to-end -end protection. Uh, so many solutions in cryptography today uh, encrypt part of the uh, one a part of a uh, segment of the network or part of a device and and the problem is that there are it leaves lots of holes for attackers. Um, we know these attackers come in. We've seen them in the press, they're well understood in classified environments. We have nation states, we have, you know, uh, bandits who are looking for money. So, uh, and, you know, the kind of full span in between. So you'll, you'll see these attackers in there. The, the end to end is really a, a, a critical element there. And, and finally, this system has to be highly resilient to attack. So you need to notice and 
uh, detect, you need to sense any attacks that are happening, and then take actions to remediate those attacks. Uh, this is to put up defenses initially, and then start discovering the, the methodology that was used to actually penetrate, and you know, then be able to, to, to roll out you know, healing patches and things like that to, uh, to go ahead and mitigate for the, for the future. Um, next slide, Pat. So we see five steps here to get to get those solutions. The first one, to get trust, you need to get the NIST approved algorithms. Uh, NIST is in the approval process. Uh, this means that you need to have the ability to deploy algorithms and possibly swap them. So <clears throat> there's a um, essentially software upgrade model for how this works. Um, the keys that are currently delivered by current silicon, CMOS, these are uh, typically pseudo random number generators are considered to be guessable from a quantum attack perspective. We have not seen the quantum computer yet that does that. We believe that's in the next oh, year to three years. Uh, and we need to see some, some refinement of those attacks. It's, it's, the, it's a very uh, high likelihood attack area right after we get the public key attacks, which have already been proven. Matter of fact, we've, we've implement them, implemented them in, in simulation you know, on a, on a quantum simulator uh, at our company. Uh, and they've been imp implemented by, by many parties. So the quantum quality keys are gonna be an important part. Um, there are technologies in the industry that are, uh, that are off the shelf that can, can deliver those keys. Uh, but the, the real trick there is getting those keys to where they need to be, that's step two. So that means getting uh, sufficiently strong keys and the algorithms to the endpoints and these are all of the nodes in your systems. These are your SCADA systems, your sensing, your control systems, your you know, legacy or modern, they, they all need to be uh, upgraded. And when you, know, when you go talk to an industry about what that upgrade looks like, um, that can be very daunting. So there are, uh, we'll get into an approach, but the approach is to not change out these devices but to simply uh, either apply software upgrade or uh, with very, very, uh, very, very closely bolt on uh, a translator, things that can cause those systems to become durable so that they can be uh, handled, moving them you know, in, their, in their most secure manner, moving them to the upgrade in their normal upgrade cycle. And there are devices I'm sure that will never be quantum upgraded for 20 years, but at some point those things do get upgraded. So, so this is the pathway we see doing that. Um, the step three is to enable every encrypted communication, encrypted storage in any, any behavior that, that, that uh, you know, uses a security protocol, any procedure in your system to get all those upgraded uh, in an easy, easy, easy to use way and, and all the devices. So covered that a moment ago. Um, next is the phased upgrade through uh, policy managed fallback. I kind of went into that in the last slide, a little ahead of the got ahead of the gun there. Um, but this, this really is the process by which you uh, permit the part of the most critical section elements of your network to be upgraded first. And these are your highest risk areas probably. And then you start rolling that out across, across the rest of the network as you have time and as you see risk and as you see threat up, up here in the, uh, on the landscape. Um, last but not least, it's monitoring the cryptography and identifying and remediating an attack. Um, this is a, a very interesting space. Uh, essentially, what, what our proposal is, is that we do anomaly detection on everything going on in the cryptography. This is the channel, the cryptographic channel. This is the cryptographic code running on either your endpoints or on these translators that are, that are tightly connected, tightly integrated with your endpoints. These are, uh, these are your, uh, your core network elements, uh, your, com your computing elements. Uh, and, and the idea there is to be able to audit, monitor, and know everything that's going on. Um, I've been an attacker uh, for about 20 years. And one of the most annoying things that can happen is to be noticed when you're doing your attack. And uh, if you've got the ability to notice an attacker and the ability to then do some disruptive things to that attacker, take some countermeasures, they can be drastic, like shutting down the element the attacker is trying to, to take control of, 
or they can be just pesky, like, you know, tightening up your security, uh, your security settings on your networking, uh, whatever they are, they uh, can drop, can basically stop an attacker in their tracks. And, and that is the, the kind of skirmish by skirmish uh, world that we live in, in the, in terms of cyber attack. Um, I think one of the big issues here and, I think Joanna was, I think Joanna, Paul and Charles were, were, were pinging on it. Uh, the, the fact is that as, as, as an attacker, if I can take down the energy, the energy sector, the critical infrastructure of this nation, that disruption starts taking down our technological leadership, our worldwide leadership. And it takes down several other leadership elements. You know, I happen to be in the tech industry, so I'm worried most about that. But if you start abbreviating that kind of development, we start losing our edge. Immediately, the world starts to catch up. Uh, Pat, let's go to the next slide. So what, we're, what we suggest is this is a software-based upgrade. I want to get into that in some more detail here. This is and also where we'll start to address cost. Um, essentially, there, if you have a device that runs cryptography today, it can run quantum-proof cryptography in about the same profile of its battery, its, its power supply, its uh, timing and latency, all of those things. So the, the quantum proof uh, algorithms are not any, any real rocket science. Matter of fact, some of the systems will actually be sped up in terms of their compute and their performance by going to post quantum. Um, we see that especially important in these uh, little edge skated devices that may be sitting on a solar panel or a battery and you know uh, need to survive out there to be able to to deliver some sensing input that you need to operate the system. Um, this, um, it also means that, for instance, on-premise servers, all your, all your backend systems can be, can be upgraded quite straightforwardly. And that can be done through myriad methods. You may want to go in and integrate tightly into an application that's running, or you may decide to, to simply upgrade the entire compute platform, the entire server. Uh, there are there are a set of, of software solutions there that work work quite smoothly and make the make minimum disruption. Um, let's see, the um, let me go on into the next the next step there. The um, zero trust. So, so we've we've built a solution that is very much aligned with the zero trust architecture, and enables implementation of zero trust across your networks. These param these uh, characteristics of a system are very important. To the uh, to the to the function of uh, our future systems, um, the government is extremely uh, hard pushing, especially DoD, on these because of the, the problems that we've had in the past with assuming uh, that perimeter security is good enough. So this is really the beginning of security in depth. Zero trust architecture is. It's been around about a decade, uh, been evolving a good bit, and I think that is a critical element that we're gonna need in our, in our most critical systems, especially power and water. Um, high availability, of course, is an extremely important characteristic uh, to, the, to the critical infrastructure industry. So uh, this system that we've, we've built is, is done with a family of orchestrators that manage, uh, they deliver keys, they monitor the cryptography, they deliver policy and audit and they do all of that stuff with a highly available architecture. Um, I've already talked about the policy controlled fallback a couple of times, so I won't go into that again. Um, and then in the cryptographic monitoring defense, that's, that's the other, that's the uh, uh, paying close attention to the attack that's going on and, and applying remediation. So if you look at this from a cost perspective, you don't need to change out the systems that are there. If you can mess with the software a touch, if we can upgrade the algorithms, and get the the uh, the small amount of code that receives keys implemented uh, on those platforms. Great. If we can't, we can bolt on an inexpensive translator that goes on beside them. So instead of having to go replace all the equipment in your networks, you can make this upgrade by just just basically sprinkling some software. As well, you'll start to be able to uh, segment your network from a security perspective if that's not already been done so that you can isolate the uh, unprotected versus the protected elements. You may find it's easier to leave some elements of a SCADA system always in an unprotected mode, but just know that they may be 
delivering erroneous data if attackers go in there and start manipulating you by by messing with the uh, the sensor inputs. So, um, in short, we've we've got your back in terms of solving this problem by offering, you know, our, our, our number one focus is making sure we can we can deliver adoption, simplicity, and and really ease of uh, ease of integration to you folks in this in this industry minimal changes you've, you've seen those those uh goals up front and so the the uh the approach here is to try to make this as simple as possible and with a very close focus on risk management and threat management and and falling back to your risk models much like the uh, say the banking industry does um we we are certain that we can get you there in a in a way that delivers the the shareholder and regulatory protections that you want you know making these things safe and keeping you out of hot water in the boardroom or in the uh in the regulatory environment and get you there with the um with with the straightforward simple upgrade that doesn't keep you up at night so um especially think about things with you know continuity of operations attacks on control systems um this is an opportunity to really kind of strengthen those and fix a lot of those legacy weaknesses so uh let me see. Uh, do I have another slide, Pat? You do not. Okay, great. Um, let's see. So, Joanna, can I hand it back to you for uh, for question and answer? Sure. Uh, Skip, did you want to handle that? Absolutely. I got it, Joanna. Thank you, everybody. And thanks to our, our panel and presenters. Again, fantastic group here um, and, and really hope this was informational. I would suggest if you have questions now, we do have some time, go ahead and type them in the Q&A down below and uh, we'll get to all, as many as we can uh, before we hit the top of the hour here. Um, so Greg, this one's for you regarding um, bringing this post quantum to smart meters. So I'll read this question to you. It's from Gloria. She says, I'm currently co-chairing SAE G32 with Boeing on cyber physical systems. Um, she says, with smart meters, as noted by Mr. Dickerson, how do you plan end-to-end -end encryption, replace all devices, and re-engineer with uh, cyber best practices for the devices? What, what, what sort of solution would you think about there? Well, I um, I've got a smart meter and uh, and a cute little box that allows me to see exactly what's what's going on in that smart meter with a Zigbee interface. Um, it's very interesting because um, in my time at Qualcomm, I I worked in the uh, I headed engineering in the government business, and we built a very large uh, vulnerability analysis capability, about 250 engineers. We would have absolutely loved to have a little monitoring device hooked up by Zigbee because that means we could we could look for the remote the opportunities to remotely penetrate those smart meters. And the nice thing about smart meters from an attack perspective is as soon as you can break into them, you can start manipulating the, the data they send back into the core. So if I can all of a sudden declare a whole lot of load that's non-existent into the core, the core will start trying to ramp up production or I can start meddling with all kinds of things like that. Um, the, um, uh, I, I would say that the, the upgrade is pretty straightforward if you can have i'd say there are two, two good approaches here first approach is if you can get if you can push software to those meters which i hope you can um, there should be some ability to upgrade it's a it's quite a straightforward and simple small patch of software to be able to, to upgrade them to post quantum and and the gist of it is we get them out of their public key encryption that can be cracked um, the expectation is, from an attack perspective, is that the post-quantum attack, the quantum computing enabled attack, will be used to find vulnerabilities that can then be deployed widely, and they can, they can essentially implant the vast majority of meters or the, the, the meters in one supplier's network. The, the goal there would be to be able to deliver a software upgrade that would both look for attack and look for the penetration that would that occur, could occur on one meter and allow you to know which meter is now the, the first bad case, the first, the first one infected. And the second thing is that software attack, that software patch, excuse me, would uh, give you the hardening and to, to permit uh, you know, safe operation in the face of those attacks being executed on your network all the time. 
you'll be able to look and find out where the attackers are and then start taking countermeasures against the attackers themselves instead of just sitting there being being shot at. So um, uh, the, the short of it is we see cryptographic algorithms last somewhere between 10 and 15 years before somebody, somebody in academia comes up with a great way to crack them. This is true with, with DES, then triple DES. Now we're seeing that quantum computing is breaking our Diffie-Hellman and our elliptic curve public key trend, you know, uh, uh, exchanges. So in short, the, the critical infrastructure industry, the energy industry is in the business of deploying gear that lasts a heck of a lot longer than that cycle. One of the things that we deliver in this software solution is the ability to roll out new algorithms in the future. It's dependent just on software upgrade. And that with that approach and, and being able to push out a software patch, we can take care of your current problem. And if in five or 10 years, we find out that these algorithms aren't sufficient or there's a new quantum attack that tackles some other part of cryptography, we'll be able to roll out a new, a new patch for those. The other solution is really to go bolt on and bolt on when you're talking smart meters isn't pretty. So what I would suggest at that point is you start doing a bolt on encryptor at the concentrator points in the, in the smart meter network so that you, uh, you know, you can, you can minimize your hardware deployment and uh, essentially keep networks of those concentrators, uh, uh, networks of those smart meters in the, within the concentrator bounds uh, tightened up. That really stops your remote attack. Most of the attacks you're gonna see with post-quantum are remote because they require having a lot of, post of, of, of quantum computing to be able to perform the penetration. That quantum computing is, is, takes, takes power, takes space, takes cooling, especially cryo cooling. So, so you're gonna see that the remote attacks are the favorites. That means that if you can put a, uh, uh, a protection box, uh, you know, protection device with the concentrator, you're, you're still keeping that to a, to a neighborhood or, or a part of a town. And that keeps, your, uh, that keeps you in a safe mode from the, from the remote attack, essentially the overseas attack. So those are the two questions. Sounds Rick, like- Rick, may I um, add on to what you said? Go ahead. Yeah, so I agree with everything Greg said. Um, as someone who oversaw the installation of roughly one and a half million of those meters in the Mid-Atlantic, the technology exists to push out software patches over the network. I agree with you 100%. The concern about the meters isn't so much what manipulating the meters it can do from an energy perspective. The concern is any ransomware that can flow through the meters back to the whole systems, the back office systems, that's the concern. Um, because ramping up meter load doesn't affect how much energy we put out onto the grid. That's okay. measured through another construct. Okay. And you're also right, there's a collector, is what we call them, that gathers information from meters. So it's two paths. And I'm just basically backstopping what Greg says, so he's percent correct. The preferred method is to push out software passes via the network to each one of the meters. By the way, those meters only last about 15 years. So if the encryption period to break through is about 15 years, by the time they get there, we'd be ready to roll out a new set of meters anyway. So utilities are always cycling meters. Uh, and, the, and the second part, again, is with the collector. If there's a way to implement the technology on a collector um, and do that over the air, then that's even better. Yeah, if that, if that collector software upgradable, we're, we're exactly. in. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, let's keep moving, folks. Thanks, Greg. Charles got some more questions here. Um, Pete, this will be for you. Um, who or what authoritative, authoritative body is going to validate and determine if a set of algorithms are quantum safe? Thanks, Skip. Well, that's a loaded question. Uh, so for the federal government, they're going through that right now. If we've uh, part of the 19 January presidential memo addressed uh, a rapid push forward. It laid out 30, 60, 90, 180 day timelines into the next fiscal year for the NIST to identify the down-select post-quantum algorithms. Those post-quantum algorithms are the ones that we're going to ride on for the future, and they're pushing that out. Um, Greg, I don't think I've seen that released yet, but it was supposed to be in the end of March, early part of April. So that, that, that question is yet to be determined because we haven't seen a release. We're watching for it. The good news about QSecure is we're working with three of the four post-quantum algorithms right now which is awesome because we're already getting to see that. They, they like and they want to ride on the DNA of the quantum entropy source that we're putting out. So we're keeping our finger on that pulse. I'm waiting with bated breath. I understood two weeks ago was supposed to be in two weeks. So I'm expecting this week, maybe next. 
uh, we also had that event happen where one of the top candidates uh, was proven to be able to be broken with basically a laptop and about 50 hours of compute time. That's not yeah. equal to secure. So, you know, if they can, if they can break, if they can break cryptography like that, they will be able to get into your systems. Yeah. Um, which is that, which is a yet even another reason, in my opinion, to have uh, those 60,000 quantum resilient keys protecting every uh, heck is down to microseconds is how you want to lay out the level eight entropy that we're pushing on those. So the threats are going to keep coming. I mean, the one good thing about this, the adversary always has a vote. And, and the question on the federal side of the house, as we come into CMMC, the cybersecurity maturation model that's coming out, that will be in accordance with the NIST and the FIBS. And we're laying out the implementation guidelines to put those in place right now. The post-quantum algorithms will be one piece, but the rest of this, Skip, to get to the, the viewer's question, is going to be uh, through the normal NIST, FIPS, FedRAMP side. CMMC rolls it out. And quite frankly, the bill that I talked about earlier, one of at least three that I found, this one's 1260, that's, that's going to give us the opportunity to go, here's our implementation guideline for that. So I hope that answered your questions. And by the way, as far as implementation is concerned, we're, we're ready. We're, we're already pushing quantum resilient keys. We're working the software environments to make sure that whatever comes on top is, first of all, we're going to be legacy compatible. So backwards compatible for the legacy systems. But we're looking at the, the what's coming next. We want to continue to give you those keys so that we keep that secure for you, regardless of which system you're on, whether it's federally approved, runs through the NIST and the FIPS and the CMMC cycle for FedRAMP, or whether you're just commercial, you need that. And I just really want to protect my financial data, biotech, HIPAA, PII, a lot of things that we were looking at. So Greg, go ahead. You had another comment. No, that was really the, I think you, you kind of tagged it. It's, you know, NIST is, is tightening up on their, thankfully they are using the world of, of the worldwide network of scientists to, to validate these algorithms. And that's why it's good to get one broken. Um, proves that the, uh, the work, the science is really going on live. Um, but the fact is, we're ready to, you know, we're, we're, we've deployed this uh, at, at one major customer and are, you know, really working to have a very easily integrated solution this calendar year. Uh, this can be, you know, pushed across your network of both TCP IP and regular, you know, kind of compute nodes, as well as the special protocols, special radio protocols, special networks um, that, you know, uh, Zigbee, SCADA, that kind of stuff. So this is a solution that can be done immediately uh, and, you know, get ahead of that quantum attack before it comes and hits. Uh, that, Greg, I like that. One, quite frankly, one of the most exciting things to me is uh, we know the vulnerabilities and the legacy platforms that are, that are part of the ICS and SCADA. I, I want to get the quantum ICS and SCADA down to the microprocessor to keep those loose ends from being loose anymore. Let's make sure we protect that because it's critical to our infrastructure. Yep. All right, let's do one, one last question here. And then I'd also say for those of you who have put questions in, if you drop your email address, we'll be happy to answer them for you. Uh, if you go ahead and put that in chat, or you can send us an email, just send it to me, skip, S-K-I-P at Q-Secure, Q-U-S-E-C-U-R-E.com. Happy to do that. Or, and also you can hit our website. We have a, a web form there as well. Last question, I'll, I'll give this one to uh, both Greg and Pete. It's two part question, Greg, first part for you. Pete, second part. So Greg, um, energy uses old systems. How can we bridge and do this new testing here? Um, in other words, we're on legacy. How, you know, how can we kind of bridge that gap? And then for Pete, what suggestions do you have on actually how they can do POCs or pilots to start testing? Go ahead. You want to go first? Sure. Uh, uh, shameless plug, right? We At QSecure, we already have NDAs. Uh, with uh, several national labs like Lawrence Livermore. Uh, obviously, getting this in a virtual environment like the 7.5 million core that live there at the TerraScale facility, which uh, oddly enough works at uh, petascale sizes, it's even faster than they planned, is a great way to go. Because what I like about that, there's one particular program, it's called ROSE, you can look it up. It actually puts the software runs it through all five degrees of freedom of compiler, and then it runs X diffs across the binary and the code to see what parts missing, what part old, what part in those five degrees of freedom 
did not compile in time or produce the wrong thing or was an old dead code. So it's neat and that we're looking to get this in. We want to show the quantum resilience. We want to show how uh, rugged these are in the real world. And the best way to do that is to put it across where we actually validate nuclear weapons, where we validate our energy grid. So that's a great way to do it. We're quite frankly, if we can get a quantum orchestrator to you and understand your software environment, Greg will give me a black eye, unlike the one that he has here. But I will say we're going to do everything we can to get this in your hands as quick as possible because you don't have time. As much as a, Q, a quantum computer is not on us, you don't have time to get any more of your data harvested, stored, or stolen because it will be used against you. Let's get you over into something that's going to, and all the, the quantum turbulence is coming, let's get you something that's stable. So that's easy. If you reach out through Skip or me, we'll find the right software environment and start pushing 60,000 keys a second at level eight entropy your way. And Greg, second half of that question, you got second that? Second half of that question, real quick. Um, so let, let me suggest um, what, what, what we're talking about for, for most systems is software upgrade, but we have the ability to do some, uh, some possibly disruptive uh, uh, changes. We can get into the, into the lower layers of the software on the system. Um, we're essentially using some antivirus practices that allow us to do some very minimal uh, interference with the operation of the system, but enable it to go to quantum. So if you've got these old old systems that need to be upgraded, that's a possibility. The last possibility is that we just bolt on uh, uh, either uh, in the same processing power or possibly on a, on a companion computing device, you know, companion server uh, that we, we bolt on a, a translator. Um, what I'd recommend is, is get in touch with us uh, and we can talk through those solutions for you. I think in any complex network, you're gonna need all four of the various solutions we offer in terms of integration, because some systems are gonna be more modifiable, some systems are gonna be less, some systems you can't even touch at all, and you just have to go with, with the, uh, the bolt-on. So the, uh, the idea is that you can balance risk, cost, deployment complexity, and, and, all of, and, and deployment timing, um, so that, you know, and, and we've, we've got these, we've built these variety of uh, solutions to be able to enable that kind of choice and risk mitigation on the side of, the, of our customers. So we're really trying to make this high adoption, easy button. And can I add one thing to that, Greg? You nailed it. Remember earlier in my comment, I said the adversary has a vote. Uh, you can, we can get you a gold-plated system, and we're happy to develop that for you. We'll also come in and look at it going, what do you need right now to shore up the loose bounds that are wide open pipes for you? So it's a, it's a better question to ask is, how do I get this right now? to work toward what is that unsupported encryption or legacy system, at least shore up what would be most vulnerable to me right now. That's, that's a great question you ask. Fantastic. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap this. Thank you to all of the attendees and all of the panelists. Fantastic webinar. Joanna, any closing comments from you on this? To thank everybody, to thank QSecure for hosting, to thank all the speakers and panelists. Uh, it was very interesting. Very good. Thank you, everybody. And we will You're see welcome. you on the next webinar. We'll keep you updated uh, with uh, different uh, webinars we, we post up on a, a monthly or quarterly basis. And thanks for listening in. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye.